So I became a novelist kind of inevitably and accidentally. I mean, inevitably not because I'm such a fabulous person that my art had to, you know, express itself, but because I really discovered I was utterly incompetent at all the other things I tried. Um, and uh, I had wanted to be a writer from the time I was a, a child, but then when, you know, when push comes to shove and you're going to college and you're supposed to take writing classes and you have to show your horrible poetry that you've written in high school to other people, um, that's a whole other, uh, other experience which I chose to um, avoid. And so I, I uh, changed my major to medieval history and decided to become a medieval historian and changed colleges and went to graduate school and um, discovered um, that I really have, uh, and I don't know why it took me this many years in school and two years in graduate school to discover that I have absolutely no memory for names, dates, or abstract ideas, which really puts you at a disadvantage as, as a historian. So um, I left graduate school and went back to New York and um, lived in my mother's uh, guest room and basically didn't get out of bed. And I would make the bed at, you know, at night. I'd sleep on the bed made because she would come in you know, like a tornado and say, get up, find a job, find an apartment. And I would just sit up and the bed was already made because I had slept on top of it. And she would come in every day with a newspaper with big red circles of apartments. and. Um, but And she was worried about me because I was kind of depressed and I had no idea what I was going to do. And I, I just, I wanted to be, I like to buy shoes. So, um, and had actually spent an entire summer when I was supposed to be studying paleography in Florence, I spent the entire summer buying shoes. And so I decided I would be a buyer at Bloomingdale's. Well, I had no retail experience whatsoever or any experience except sitting in a library studying um, medieval manuscripts or buying shoes for myself. So I couldn't even get, I couldn't get anywhere with that. And then a friend of my mother's took, who was a, someone I really, really admired and had been very supportive over the years, um, uh, was at the time an editor at the Village Voice. And she said, I think she took pity on my mother and she said, why don't you, me, write a piece um, for The Voice that I will edit about, um, I had spent a year in the hospital from various things, and she said, why don't you write about that experience? So I did, and um, and it was, you know, and they published it, and it was a great relief because it was something I actually knew how to do and could do, and um, it, was, it was very exciting. And then as she was editing it, she would say, um, well, this is for the novel. This is for the novel. And so I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try that. But I didn't tell anyone because, you know, I knew too many people who were going to Paris to write a novel. And then, you know, obviously, if you have to go to Paris to write a novel, you're probably not going to write the novel. So I, um, so I, just, I just did it kind of secretly, and I wrote a page a day, and... Um, and, th and that's how I started. And then I've been incredibly um, fortunate <coughs> in that I've been able to, in some manner, um, support myself writing and uh, you know doing journalism, which I continued to do. And um, and of course, uh, I, you know, it's been I, so. That's that's how that happened. So I really backed into it. It's what I always wanted to do, but it was you know I didn't really think I could. And then in terms of the daily process, that kind of changes with each book. The, the first book I wrote very religiously, one day, one page a day, no more, no less. That way I didn't scare myself, but I kept going. Second book took seven years because I had little children. And since then, it's just been a juggling act of uh, you know, trying to find a little bit of time. I, I am not one of those people who, um, who needs... Um, you know, either the cafe in Paris or the qu absolutely quiet space, um, which I've never had in my life. There's always something going on with my um, family on either end, 
parents, children, and or me making a mess of things. So, um, I'm sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I usually, you know, just I, I can write 20 minutes. If I find 20 minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll write. If I uh, usually takes about eight hours to get three hours of work, real work in. So uh, Finn and Lady is a kind of love story. Um, it's about an 11-year-old boy named Finn and his 23-year-old, 24-year-old, excuse me, she, her age changed as I wrote the book, um, a 24-year-old half-sister named Lady. And um, she is, she ends up uh, as his guardian um, raising him in, in Greenwich Village in 1964. So I'm gonna, um, it's a it's a love story and it's about growing up in a time when growing up was not very fashionable. Finn's funeral suit was a year old, worn three times already too small. He knew his mother was sick. He knew she went to the hospital to get treatments. He saw the dark blue lines and dots on her chest. My tattoos, she said. She sang Popeye the Sailor Man and raised her skinny arms as if to flex her Popeye muscles to make him laugh. He knew she was sick. He knew people died, but he never thought she would die. Not his mother, not really. Lady came to the funeral, an unmistakably foreign presence in the bare white congregational church. She wore large sunglasses and wept audibly. Finn's neighbors, the Pounds, who raised big, thick Morgan horses, had been looking after Finn since his mother was taken to the hospital. I'm sure your mother knew what she was doing, Mr. Pound said doubtfully when he saw Lady Hadley approach, her arms wide open, a lighted cigarette dangling from her lips. I don't think she had much choice, dear, Mrs. Pound whispered to him. There was no one else, was there? I like Lady, Finn said loyally, but she was terrifying, coming at him like some mad bird with a squawk of fratello mio, it's all so dreadful. Lady put her arms around him and held him close. She was all he had, as Mrs. Pound had pointed out, all he had. He barely knew her, unfamiliar arms, a stranger's cheek wet with tears leaking from beneath her dark glasses. He wanted to cry, too, for so many reasons that they seemed to cancel one another out. He stood there like a statue, nauseated and faint. The other mourners stared at Lady. Why wouldn't they? She stood out. She vibrated almost in that quiet church. She was beautiful. Finn liked her hair, which was long. He liked her teeth. She thought they were too big, but she was wrong. She was like a horse, not one of the pound's heavy Morgan horses with short, sturdy necks and thick, clomping legs. She was like a racehorse, jittery, majestic. Her long neck and long legs, and her face, too, she had a horsey face in a beautiful way, and bangs like a forelock. He'd told her that the last time he'd seen her. He had been five. You look like a horse, he'd said. Charming, said Lady, me and Eleanor Roosevelt. He had not meant that at all. Eleanor Roosevelt, whose picture he'd seen in the newspaper, did not look like a horse, more like his grandmother, big, sloping breast, important face. He meant that Lady's eyes were huge and dark, that her cheekbones were high and pronounced, that her face was aristocratic and long, that her hair flew in the wind like a mane, that she was coltish, even in her movements of tentative wildness and reckless dignity. He didn't know that he meant all that when he was five. He just knew that she reminded him of a horse. He was 11 now. He had not seen her for six years. She still reminded him of a horse, a racehorse, he had added when he was five, 
and Lady had smiled and said, oh, that's all right then. When the funeral was over, Lady would not allow him to go to the gravesite. It's barbaric, she said to Mr. and Mrs. Pound. They looked at her with shocked faces, pinched by hurt at what they rightly took to be Lady's dismissal of every aspect of almost 2,000 years of religious tradition. The kid is hanging on by his eyelids, she said. I saw Daddy buried, Finn said, and Grandma and Grandpa. I rest my case, said Lady. You're the boss, Mr. Pound said. He heaved a sigh, then he shook Finn's hand and wished him luck in his new life. Mrs. Pound hugged him and said he'd make his mother proud in heaven, and then he did start to cry and ran outside. Humiliating to cry at his age. Babies cried. The Pounds had a baby, a bald, sticky one that screamed for no reason, out of the blue. Mrs. Pound would pick it up and hug it. Finn wanted to shake it, although really he could not imagine even touching it. It was an obnoxious baby. I'll give you something to cry about, Finn's father used to say. Then he died. The Pounds baby had its parents. Stuart was its name. Finn had taken one of its toys and given it to the dog. The baby didn't even notice. Lady found him outside, pressed against the side of the church, still crying like Stuart, who didn't even know enough to realize his toy had been stolen. Go away, he said. Fat chance. Leave me alone. Come on, pal. She took his hand gently. Just please go away, he said. He tried to pull his hand back. Lady did not let go. Instead, she gave a violent pull. Hey, he said, quit it. She had almost yanked him off his feet. See, she said, nothing like a good shock. No more tears, poof, just like hiccups. They walked toward the parking lot. He kept what he hoped was a safe distance. His mother had called Lady a loose cannon, among other things. Come on, Finino, she said, reaching out, taking his hand. Her voice was so gentle now. Finino, that's what she'd called him the first time he saw her. Come on, Finino, she said again. Let's go home. Um, I wondered, when you write, how much um, certain images are what you start with or certain characters? Um, what, what it is that really gets you going when you're starting a book or starting a chapter? Um, it's usually characters. Um, in this case, it was, it was kind of the, or relationships, um, which means characters. And in this case, it was the idea of um, an older sibling having to raise this child, um, and especially in the 1960s when, A, you weren't really supposed to grow up and when everything was kind of changing so quickly. And, and I was also very interested in the idea of a very, uh, a, a woman who sees herself as a rebel and who, who um, um, glorifies freedom um, on the one hand, having to take this responsibility, and on the other, seeing the whole social scene sort of catch up with her and then pass her by. Um, so it was kind of those relationships that I started with, and but there are often um, just very specific images that um, that inform a scene or that make me think of something that that kind of suggest the way a character might behave and um, so it's it's a combination but I no, I, I definitely start with with characters um, which often means that the plot is a bit of a problem um, but you know you have to have your priorities so I lost my parents both of them um, when I was in my 20s and I had a brother 11 years younger, so I'm very eager to oh. read this. This is in the, the 60s and early 70s. Um, I loved what you did with the relationship among the sisters in the last novel. Why Thank did you. you make him a little boy? 
Well, for one thing, um, I was, I had just written a book about three sisters. And the idea of writing another book about two other sisters was interesting. But, um, you know, in the same way that you probably don't like to read the same thing over and over, and um, I, I had the urge to try something new and, and something different. Um, and I also, you know, there is a tradition. There's the Auntie Mame, and there's um, Travels with My Aunt. Um, and, and I think that probably, without me really realizing it, kind of um, suggested the little boy to me. But also, I really, really, you know, the Three Wisemans was... Um, a lot of, uh, really, really a lot of fun to write, and I was very happy with the way it came out. But w I become very involved in these books as I'm writing, and I really wanted to get away from all these women. It was <laughs> so many women, and I love women in many, many ways, but I really felt that I wanted to write about boys and men as well as, as, well as Lady, um, who I think is... Um, kind of enigmatic, but still um, a woman. So, but it, but I, and and originally I I was thinking of starting the book. In fact, I did start the book as a um, in the first person as a um, a kind of the uh, Finn as a sixty year old man looking back. Um, but it for some reason it was very arch and it just didn't work. And um, so I gradually sort of came to this decision to do it this way. Um, I'm interested when you said that, that the voice was arch. Is that something you can tell yourself as you're writing, or do you give your work to other people to read, and if so, at what stages? It's, um, it's always a danger when I start out, because it's, an easy, it's easy um, to do that, and it's cheap. And, um, and, and sometimes when you start out, um, you know, you don't know the characters yet, trying to make jokes, trying to make it fun, and without really um, confronting the real book. And so I know it's a, um, it's a danger for me, and I am aware of it, but I also give it to um, people who, you know, in early stages, I have a few people who, who read it and who will tell me um, that that's a problem or whatever other millions of problems there are. Um, and then, of course, then the problem, the, the question always is, at what point do you give it to someone? And, what, and how much do you trust yourself? And how much do you trust someone reading it? And so when someone will, one of these two or three people that I will show it to will say, um, you know, there's a problem with this, there's a problem with that, I always have to take a deep breath. And um, I remember with one book, uh, the editor that I had ha was utterly humorless. I mean, it was, and I'm not going to say which book or who it was, but I mean, it was sort of, uh, it, it just was an accident that I ended up with this editor, and and I was enraged by everything she said because she would sort of write things like, this is a non sequitur, you know, and to which I would say, no, that is called a joke. <laughs> and so anything she did made me crazy. But my girlfriend said, look, she has no sense of humor, but, you know, she's a human being who's reading this, and she's stumbling on something. And she may not know what it is, and she may not be able to say it, and what she does say may be absolutely wrong, and it may be nothing, but you have to pay attention to those moments where people have what in the movie business, you know, they, they bump on something. And um, and that was very good advice because now I take a deep breath, I look at it, and I think either, yes, there's something amiss here, or I think, no, this is just what I want, and I'm going to make this work as the book goes along. There's going to be a payoff. This is this is what I want. But it but it never hurts um, to kind of look at something and um, reevaluate it. It's just very important not to do it too early because then you get kind of paralyzed and can't can't do anything. So you have to sort of let her rip for a while and write a lot of bad stuff and then go back and and uh, examine it. 
questions. But by the way, I just want to say about um, writing about this uh, little boy losing his parents. Um, when I started, I thought, oh, this will be a sort of fun, light book. And then I thought, wait a minute, this little boy just lost both his parents. This is really quite sad. And um, it completely changed the way I had kind of initially thought of the book. And I, um, one of the things that kind of made me think about doing this was I have a sister who's actually 30 years younger than I am, who, a uh, half-sister, who came to live with us when she was in her 20s. And um, it was such an interesting dynamic to have this young person who wasn't one of my children, she's the same age as my kids, but who wasn't one of my kids, and who would kind of, sometimes I would find myself talking to her as if she were a sister, and then I'd think, oh my God, she's like a kid. And other times, I, you know, I'd say, like, go to bed. It's too late, and you stayed out too late. And then I'd think, wait a minute. She's not my child. So um, it was. I found it very interesting, and it kind of, that also kind of um, inspired the, the idea. Thank you, Thank you all for, for coming. And <laughs>